Greetings. Greetings and welcome to Southern Gables Online. My name is Nathaniel Lawton, and I serve on staff as the director of middle school and connections. Thanks so much for choosing to join us for worship today. If you're new, if Southern Gables isn't your normal church home, let me say an extra special welcome just to you. We are thrilled that you have chosen to spend some time with us today. Whether this is your first service here or you've been here for 40 years, please take a moment to click the link just below this video to fill out our register. This will let us know that you are here and it's a great way for you to let us know how we can be praying for you. Speaking of prayer, this week is one thing, our monthly praise and prayer service. We are pleased to announce that we will be live streaming on a new platform that should allow for increased interaction during our times of prayer. Be sure to mark your calendars for 6.30 p.m. this Wednesday and tune in. All right, families with kiddos four years old through sixth grade, listen up. For several weeks now, we have been teasing you with the idea that something is coming. That something is our super cool summer spectacular. Beginning mid-June and running for six weeks, this will be an incredible time of weekly video teaching, interactive silliness and learning, and a take-home box. This box will be filled with super cool activities and surprises. We don't want you to miss out. So please be sure as soon as possible, let us know that you want in on the action so we can get your take home box ready for you. Please contact Than Baylor or Kathy Williams for more information. This week, we are pleased to have an update from the Ekdals, part of our extended church family. After we hear from them, we are fortunate to be led in worship this week by Pastor Jason Rose. Pastor Jason and his family, his wife and three children, live in Pagosa Springs and are personal friends of Pastor Jeff. We are glad to have him with us today. Hello, Southern Gables. We're the Ekdals reporting from West Africa. And while the borders are closed here, we're really thankful that we can still connect with you via video. We've been in quarantine for about nine weeks now. Uh, and we've been stuck at home and not been able to see any of our friends or anybody else during this time. Uh, yeah, so we've been doing online school for like six weeks. And Gab and I only have three weeks left, two weeks more of online classes and then exam week, unfortunately. I feel like they should have just canceled it. Um, but we are lucky in that we actually got to continue school because a lot of people around here, um, there is no other option. Online school it can't happen. So, I mean, at least we got mental stimulation. <laughs> and we only have two weeks left. Yeah. Two weeks. Yes. So yes, Levi is very excited to have school be done, but we are living with quite a few uh, daily restrictions. Uh, so we can't travel between regions. We can't even leave our city right now. So that's pretty major. Uh, we also have a nightly curfew. So from 8 p.m. to 6 a.m., no one is allowed to be on the street. And there's talk of expanding that as well. Uh, driving around town, we cannot even fit our whole family in a car. They have limits on how many people can be in your car. So we don't drive around town even together. Uh, masks have to be worn. If you don't, you might be on the paddy wagon on your way to jail. So uh, things are fairly restrictive. But that said, we've been really encouraged how well the government here has responded. And they've been really on top of things and... And so in terms of that, we've been really thankful, especially given that the, the medical system really does not have much capability uh, here. We've heard only 50 ventilators in this country, so that's not a lot. So we want to try and stay well. Um, the, the thing that has been more concerning for us, because we're overall doing well, other than just feeling cooped up, but uh, a lot of people here live hand to mouth. Uh, they just, they are dependent on their daily job to feed themselves and their families. 
And as things continue to get more restrictive, and even recently the markets only are, can only be open for three days a week now, and so people don't have refrigerators and aren't able to store food or have the money to have a stock. And so people are getting hungrier and just struggling more. And so that really is a concern for us, for our friends and for our neighbors here. Yes, so please be praying. Um, pray for Senegal as the numbers unfortunately are rising now despite the quarantine. So we expect this quarantine to last for longer. So that's a prayer request for our family. Uh, to be able to just keep going and in this time of isolation. And please uh, pray as well for our friends and neighbors and all the people around us um, who are struggling to meet their needs each day. We are having uh, participating with one of our teams up north in a food relief distribution project, and we are thankful that we are able to to be here and be able to help in that way, sharing uh, food and hygiene supplies as well as the Word of God with people. And we pray that it touches people's lives both today and for eternity as well. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. 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 Don't forget to subscribe. Good morning, Southern Gables Church. Thanks for having me join you this morning in our time of musical worship wanted to open up this morning uh, a little differently. It's from 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 17. And it's just a place God has had me this week as we continue to be socially distanced. Uh, that it's something that folks like the Apostle Paul um, are familiar with. And uh, they're familiar with that longing to be back together. So, 1 Thessalonians 2, verse 17 says... But since we were torn from you, brothers, for a short time, in person, not in heart, we endeavored the more eagerly and with great desire to see you face to face. You know how true for us during this time. So many of us long to say those words of Psalm 122.1. I was glad when they said unto me, let us go to the house of the Lord. Or that old hymn, when we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that will be. We can say now, wow, when we can all get back and worship together in church, what a day of rejoicing that will be. And my prayer for us during this time is that we can also heed the words of Paul in Philippians 4, verse 12, where he said, I've learned the secret of being content in every situation. Lord God, that's our prayer this morning. As we sing these words of truth, words that the early church used to declare their faith, their trust, and their hope in you. Well, I believe in God the Father, almighty maker of heaven, maker of earth, and in Jesus Christ his only begotten Son. Our Lord, He was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, He was crucified, buried, and dead. I believe what I believe is what makes me what I am. Amen. Oh, I did not make it. No, it is making me, it is the very truth of God and not the invention of any man. Let's sing the next part. Well, I believe that he who suffered was crucified, buried, and dead. And he descended into hell and on the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven Where he sits at God's mighty right hand And I believe that he's returning To judge the quick and the dead and the sons of men And I believe what I believe Is what makes me what I am 
I did not make it. No, it is making me. I said I did not make it. No, it is making me. We say we did not make it. No, it is making us. It is the very truth of God and not the invention of any man. Oh, I believe it. I believe. We believe it, church. We believe it. We believe. I believe it, I believe, we believe, we believe it, we believe. Well, would you join me now in reciting the words of the early church, their statement of faith of what they believed in. That very often times when they gathered together like we're gathering together now, although, you know, surprised they didn't have the internet, but when they gathered together in small groups, this is how they declared, one of the ways they declared their faith and hope in Christ Jesus. So if you would join me, the words to the Apostles' Creed will be here on the screen. Let's recite this together. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell, and on the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven, and he sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of the saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Well, we're going to continue in our time of worship here. and I um, wanted to read from Psalm 148. As you see behind me here, um, a little bit of creation is coming through the window. Uh, I've got some wonderful oak trees that grow in my front yard, and uh, I just love looking at the way they grow and the way they're gnarled and just think of God's unbelievable ability to create, His majesty as a creator God. Um, and so we're going to sing about that here this morning in a second, um, but we're also going to read from uh, Psalm 148, just a few of the verses, starting with verse 1. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord from the heavens. Praise him in the heights. Praise him, all his angels. Praise him, all his hosts. Praise him, sun and moon. Praise him, all you shining stars. Praise him, you highest heavens. And then he goes on to list all sorts of things that praise the Lord. But he sums it up in verse 13. Let them praise the name of the Lord, for his name alone is exalted, and his majesty is above all the earth and the heavens. Let's sing. All creatures of our God and King, lift up your voice and with us sing. Oh, praise Him. Alleluia. Thou burning sun with golden beam, Thou silver moon with softer gleam, Oh, praise Him, oh, praise Him. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Let all things their creator bless. Let all things their creator bless. And worship him in humbleness. Oh, praise him. Hallelujah. Praise, praise the Father, praise the Son. And praise the Spirit three in one. 
So thankful for that redeeming love, that redeeming love that sets us free. Well, this next song, a little song that I wrote uh, with the inspiration of Galatians 5.1 and a bunch of other scripture, but Galatians 5.1, I'll, I'll read it for us here. It says, it is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm then, and do not let yourselves be burdened again by a yoke of slavery. Amen. It is for freedom that Christ has set us free. At Calvary, grace and peace were one. With every nail they drove into the Holy One. And so we raise our voice and joy rejoice to the risen One. We are the ransom love, Jesus God's own Son. It is for freedom he lived, for freedom he died, for freedom he came for you and I. It is for freedom he came, lived, for freedom he died, for freedom he came for you and I. And all our shackled days are done, it is for joy the captives run. Sin has come undone at the name of Christ. It's for freedom he lived. It is for freedom he lived, for freedom he died, for freedom he came for you and I. It is for freedom he lived, for freedom he died, for freedom he came for you and I and all our shackled days are done it is for joy the captives run sin has come undone at the name of Christ I will sing of my redeemed and his wondrous love for me on the cruel cross he suffered from the curse to set me free sing oh sing my redeemer with his blood he purchased me and on the cross my pardon paid the debt and made me free. Let's sing it again. Sing, oh, sing of my Redeemer. With his blood he purchased me. And on the cross he sealed 
my part and paid the debt and made me free. It is for freedom he lived, for freedom he died, for freedom he came for you and I. Amen. Would you pray with me? Lord God, thank you for that truth, that it is for freedom that you have set us free. May we no longer be burdened by the yoke of slavery. And Lord God, now as we worship through the hearing of the word, Lord, we lift up Pastor Jeff. We lift up the words that he's going to speak. Lord God, I thank you for the man of God that he is, uh, the person that I know that whether he is standing in front of a congregation or uh, he's in his gym shorts, Lord God, he loves you. And uh, he is truly a man after your own heart and Southern Gables are so blessed to have him as their pastor. Lord God, we pray now that the words he speaks, that not a single one of them would fall to the ground pray this all in your name, Jesus. Amen. Good morning. Welcome to Southern Gables Church. Thanks for joining us today online. My name is Jeff Daly and I'm one of the pastors here at Southern Gables. I'm glad you've joined us this morning. If you have a Bible, a copy of God's Word, uh, please turn with me now to the great book of Romans. Uh, Romans chapter 8 is going to be our point of departure. If you don't have a Bible, you can download one online for free. I recommend the English Standard Version or the ESV. Now you need to know here at Southern Gables that we love the Bible because it's God's Word. A book like no other. It shows us how to live. It tells us how the world runs. And it will always lead us in the right direction. Have you noticed all the groaning lately? Uh, certainly it hasn't escaped your notice. Everywhere you go, everywhere you look, everywhere you listen, what do you hear? Lots of heavy sighs. <sighs> lots of eyes rolling. Lots of moaning and groaning. You know, the 24-hour news cycle is full of moaning and groaning. Whose fault is the coronavirus? Is it a conspiracy? Uh, should we give up a few of our personal liberties in order to enjoy more safety? Uh, when and how should we reopen? How should the church reopen? What's an essential business? What's not an essential business? So much inconsistency and contradiction and uncertainty. And at times it can be maddening. Lots of groaning. Just go on social media and what do you see? your entire news feed filled with moaning and groaning about our political leaders and the way they're running the nation, the states, and the cities and the counties. Our news feeds have become one big collective protracted groan as far as the finger can scroll. Now, the economy is groaning loudly as these weekly unemployment numbers continue to rise. Each and every one of those represents a lost job and a real person. Millions of people have joined this sigh, this symphony of sighs. And some of us are groaning because we're working at home trying to school our kids at home. If you have a couple of kids, that's a lot of assignments to keep track of. And there's a lot of frustrated children and parents and teachers that are groaning loudly right now. And plans have been interrupted. Okay, plans for graduation, plans for weddings, plans for vacation, and with it, lots of groaning. Uh, surely you've noticed these sighs and moans and groans. Let me ask you, have you ever thought about what a groan really is? Well, what's really happening when we go, ah? If you think about it for a moment, a groan is a form of lament. A groan is a form of mourning. A groan is a wordless expression 
of grief or sorrow. To groan is to bewail the present state of our lives and world. When we groan, we're expressing a heartfelt disappointment about having to live in a fallen world with sin and sickness and disease and problems and pandemics. When we groan, we're acknowledging that everything in life isn't the way it should be. When we groan, whether we recognize it or not, we're groaning not only about something, but we're groaning for something. When we groan, we're groaning for glory. We're groaning for glory because we long for the glory that is promised to us in Romans 8, verses 17 through 18 that we looked at last week. When we groan, it's a deep, visceral, primitive longing for a world that God intended for us. Not this. As we come to Romans chapter 8, Paul has told us that everlasting glory is coming for those of us who are in Jesus Christ. Yes, we have to suffer with Jesus, but we'll be glorified with Jesus. But the good news is that our inheritance as children of God is so great that it makes every trouble seem small in comparison. If you belong to Jesus, there's no comparison between the present hard times and the coming good times. So yes, glory is coming. And while we wait for it to come, there's lots of groaning because the universe isn't as it should be. In Romans chapter 8, we see three groanings that characterize this present age. The groaning of creation in verse 22. The groaning of believers in verse 23. And the groaning of the Holy Spirit in verse 26. I think it's an amazing thing that our God is not a dispassionate observer but rather he shares our disappointments with us in this fallen creation and he groans with us as we pray for glory. Over the next couple of weeks, I'm gonna take a look more carefully at these three groans, these three laments. Why? Because behind these three laments, we will see how God in the gospel of Jesus Christ has made provision for our deepest longings. What we really want more than anything can only be satisfied in Jesus. Hopefully these sermons will not be groaners since you already have enough to groan about without me piling on. So let's listen to the groan of creation first. Here's where we see creation groaning for complete restoration. Look with me at Romans 8 and verse 22. For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. All of creation is being personified here. A pause taking poetic liberty here to describe creation as if it were a real person groaning and crying in sorrow over the present state of this world. And while creation groans and moans its present plight, it also looks forward to a new world. Now, some years ago, I had one of those no good, very bad, terrible types of days. We all have had them, right? Nothing went right that day. I felt like everybody was unhappy with me. Nobody wanted to see me. Lots of groaning. So I groaned my way home myself. And as I walked up to the front porch, I saw my son waiting for me. He was standing on his tiptoes, stretched to be as tall as he could so that he could see out the front window watching for my approach. And as I got closer, our eyes met. He was the first person that I had seen all day long who was glad to see me. He had been anxiously anticipating my arrival. Now that's what verse 22 is saying. Creation is waiting in earnest expectation. Creation is standing on its tiptoes, stretching out its neck, looking to see as far as it can, filled with expectation, ready and prepared for the dawning of a new age. And what is it straining to see? The revealing of the sons of God, right? All of creation is waiting, as it were, for the sons and the daughters of God to be revealed. 1 John 3, 2 says, Beloved, we are God's children now, and what we are has not yet appeared. But we know that when he appears, when Jesus appears, we will be like him because we shall see him as he is. Right now, the world can't tell who the sons and daughters of God are. 
We look just like them. We go to work just like them. We mow our lawns just like they do. And they don't know us. But we have glory on the inside. They don't know that even though it leaks out and it's impossible to contain, we are still ensconced in all of our humanness. The glory inside us is veiled as children of God. Now question, why is creation longing for the sons and daughters of God to be revealed? Because when Jesus returns, his children will be glorified in his presence forever. And get this, all of creation will be renewed. Our glorification and creation's renewal are inextricably tied together. When we're freed from our groanings, creation will be freed from its groanings. This is why all of creation is standing on its tiptoes with necks stretched out, watching and waiting to see this unveiling. And oh my, we are going to be glorified forever. And it's going to be a glory without compare. I ask you, are you worn out this morning? Tired of all the broken down experiences of life? Tired of waiting for things to happen in your life that never seem like they're going to happen? Uh, Tired of all the flies in the ointment of your life? Tired of death and decay and division in our world? Tired of things not being the way they should be in our relationship with God, in our family, in our places of work? then you need to remember that when Christ appears, who is your life, then you will also appear with him in glory. Okay, that's what Colossians 3, 4 says. In what? In glory. In glory. In blazing, white, hot, resplendent glow of divine glory. When Christ appears, your sin nature will be gone forever. I mean, can you say amen to that? All of your struggles and trials and burdens and tribulations and groanings will be gone forever. You will be with Jesus and you will be like Jesus. Now, this may cause you to wonder, why is creation groaning in the first place? Uh, What happened to cause the creation to groan? Verse 20 supplies us with that answer. Take a look at it. The answer is this. Creation was subjected to futility. Verse 20, for the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. Why is creation groaning in the first place? Because when man fell into sin, God cursed the creation. And ever since then, it's been subjected to futility. Now, a few important things I want you to notice in this text. First, creation, as I said, is subjected to futility. Do you see that? It says, for the creation was subjected to futility. Futility means aimlessness or vanity. In other words, because of the fall, creation is no longer able to successfully accomplish the purpose for which it was created. Creation can no longer live out its full potential. Originally, God made the earth and he said that it was very good. Okay, there was no sin. There was no curse. The garden paradise in which Adam and Eve were placed was a place of work and worship and rest and productivity. There wasn't a hint of futility. Everything seemed to bear fruit effortlessly. I mean, Adam just went through the garden and he picked the fruit. It was there. It was that simple. It was perfect. Now, the past couple of years, I've had a front row seat to this futility myself. About six years ago, Christy and I planted a peach tree in our yard. Uh, Last year, it produced some beautiful fruit, 20 to 30, 40, uh, 20 to 30 beautiful peaches, uh, just ready for the picking. Finally, after watering it and fertilizing it for years, it was producing fruit. Each and every day, I would go out and inspect the fruit. Then, you live in Colorado, you know how the story is going to go from here. Then the day before I planned to pick the fruit, a hailstorm came through and put divots in my precious peaches. I mean, friends, they look like golf balls. In order to salvage them, I had to meticulously, you know, cut out all of the places that were damaged. Now, this year, the tree was looking really good. 
It was loaded with blossoms and it appeared that we would enjoy a bumper crop. Then, you know how the story goes, a snowstorm came through on Easter weekend and now my peaches are no more. Ever since the fall, creation has been spinning its wheels. Now it's plagued by smog and garbage and tsunamis and earthquakes and pandemics. But even in the midst of this futility, we still see signs of glory. We see the glory of the Rocky Mountains set against the blue sky. We see the glory of summer flowers that fill the mountain meadows. If this is what a fallen creation looks like, can you imagine what an uncursed earth looked like? Now, second, I want you to notice that creation, get this, is an involuntary victim. Uh, This futility isn't something creation chose, but rather it's something that happened to it. The text says, for the creation was subjected to futility, get this, not willingly, but unwillingly because of him who subjected it. When man sinned and plunged the entire creation into futility, creation became an involuntary victim. Man sinned willingly, right? Man sinned deliberately, right? But creation was the true victim. And it happened because God cursed it. Man sinned and God cursed the creation. Man's sin, get this, has cosmic significance. Man's sin causes all of creation to groan for restoration. And you remember what happened to Adam and Eve, don't you? Listen to what Genesis 3 has to say. And to Adam he said, Because you have listened to the voice of your wife and have eaten of the tree which I have commanded you, you shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground because of you. In pain you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you, and you shall eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your face you shall eat bread, till you return to the ground out of which you were taken. For you are dust, and to dust you shall return. God cursed the earth, and all of creation was caught up in the curse, which brings what? Futility, death, decay, and disaster. Where there used to be harmony and symmetry in creation, now the forces of nature seem to work against themselves and against us. One theologian says, Everywhere our eyes meet images of death and decay, the scourge of barrenness, the fury of the elements, the destructive instincts of beasts, the very laws which govern vegetation, everything gives nature a somber hue. And he continues, he says, humanity, who is supposed to tend and keep the garden paradise, has victimized it. The animal world has been invaded by fear and violence. Uh, The loveliest scenes in nature, while remaining beautiful, are also witnesses to bloody horrors. Floods and hurricanes and droughts and tornadoes and blights and avalanches and earthquakes and pandemics stalk the earth. All of creation groans and is unable to fulfill the potential for which God created it. Creation is an involuntary victim. Third, creation is to be set free when God's children are set free. Now, I like the way the New Living Translation puts verse 21. It says, all of creation anticipates the day when it will join God's children in glorious freedom from death and decay. You see, nature's destiny is inseparably linked to man's destiny. Because man sinned and fell, creation fell. But when God's children are restored, creation will be restored. And on that glorious day, the earth's groaning will cease. Creation will be able to reach its full potential, finally. Peach trees will be loaded with peaches, never again to be destroyed by springtime snows. Okay, death's cruel march will cease. Uh, The word pandemic is going to need to be removed from our dictionaries. No more murder hornets. Uh, The smog over L.A., if you can imagine, is going to be gone forever. The people living in the Himalayas will be able to see the beautiful, glorious mountains 
once again. The mountains, as the Bible says, will rejoice and be glad. The trees, if you can imagine this, will clap their hands and sing for joy. Creation's full potential will be realized. And friends, all of creation anticipates this deliverance. Look at verse 22. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. Okay, you see, the earth is groaning like a woman in labor. It, it, it desperately wants to be delivered. These groans are the groans of anticipation that God will bring forth a new age. Now, many of us guys have pictures of our wives after they've delivered one of our children. Uh, typically, the baby is in their arms and they have a look of exhaustion on their faces, but they're also radiant with joy. Now, none of us have pictures of our wives in labor. None of us, if we're smart, reach for our wallets and say, hey, let me show you a picture of my wife groaning in labor. Isn't the agony terrific? Now, if you think that's a good idea, you need to come talk to me. When Jesus returns, creation will be delivered. And the difference between then and now is the difference between agony and ecstasy. Some day our groaning for a creation that is made right will issue forth into the freedom of the glory of the children of God. Think what will happen when nature is free to produce as it was designed. Free from pestilence, free from disaster. If you are in Christ, you will see this day. So let me pull this all together for you. Here's the big picture. When man fell into sin, creation was cursed. It was subjected to futility and unable to reach the full potential for which it was created. But when Jesus returns and comes again, the curse is going to be lifted. The children of God will become like Jesus and all of creation is going to be restored. All of creation now is on its tiptoes, groaning in anticipation of this glorious day. So while we wait for Jesus to return, we groan, but our hope is greater than our groanings. Uh, why, you say? This seems like we have so much to groan about, especially lately. Well, we do have a lot that we could groan about. We do have a lot of reasons to genuinely lament. We do have ample reasons for godly grief, to shed godly tears. But friends, our hope is greater than our groanings because the biggest thing about us, the truest thing about us, is not the futility and the disorder that characterizes our present lives, but the hope that the Holy Spirit sets before us today. I want you to see today two reasons why our hope is greater than our groanings. First of all, we have a hope that's greater than our groanings because God has broken, get this, the entropy in Jesus Christ. You've heard about entropy, haven't you? It's the second law of thermodynamics. And it basically says that everything left to itself has a tendency to decay and to trend toward chaos and disorder. Entropy is the reason why your sprinklers work fine in the summer. Then in the fall, you blow them out and you prepare them for winter. You winterize them. Then in the springtime, when you fire them up, they're all broken again. Entropy is the reason why your teenager cleans their room and then just a couple of days later, it's a disaster. Entropy is the reason why summer begins with all types of plans and activities and it ends in the living room with one member of the family saying to another member of the family, what do you want to do? I don't know, what do you want to do? I don't know, what do you want to do? That's entropy. The universe is winding down, it's groaning. And because of the fall and the curse, it's groaning. And God could have let the entropy have its way with the universe forever, okay? He could have let entropy have its way in our lives. He could have let us slide into this bottomless pit of death and hell forever. And all he'd have to do is nothing. But he didn't do that. He broke the entropy of decay through the incarnation and death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Look at verse 20 again. For the creation 
was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope. Do you see that? That the creation will be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. What's the hope? The hope of which this text speaks is the hope that God gave when he cursed the earth. He cursed it, but he also promised at that time in Genesis 3.15 that he would send a redeemer to reconcile humanity back to himself and ultimately restore all of creation. And that redeemer is Jesus Christ. He came the first time to bear the cross and he'll come the second time to wear the crown of glory. Jesus is our living hope. And right now we are in the latter stages of God's rescue program. Jesus could return at any time. If you are in Christ, entropy will not have the last word in your life. If you aren't in Christ, entropy does not have to have the last word in your life. Let me ask you, what's the biggest truth right now shaping your mindset and outlook on a daily basis? The groanings and frustrations of the old order, entropy, or the hope that you have in Jesus Christ? Talk radio or God's word? Uh, Do you talk more about crooked politicians and welfare cheats than you do about how wonderful Jesus is? Are you more scared about what's happening in our world than hopeful for Jesus' return? When your friends and your family and your neighbors and your coworkers listen to you, and friends, they do, where is the volume the loudest? Is it the groan frequency or the hope frequency? Okay, Is, is it entropy or optimism? We have a great hope in Jesus Christ because God has broken the entropy of sin and death and hell and the grave forever. But in order for these truths to shape our lives, we must fill our minds with them. Okay, not with groaning, not with anxiety, not with all of the negativity of our world. Transformation, the Bible says in Romans 12, 1 begins with the mind. What does that mean? It means that we need to get the right content into our minds. Do you want to do something that will redeem the remainder of 2020 from the coronavirus and these murder hornets? Uh, How about reading Romans chapter 8 once a day for the rest of the year? How about, get this, committing the entire chapter to memory? Talk about transformative. If the book of Romans is a mountaintop, a high mountaintop in the New Testament, Romans chapter 8 is the highest peak in the entire range. Can you think of anything more transformative to saturate your mind with? Now, second, we have a hope greater than our groanings because we can become children of God through faith in Jesus Christ. Entropy does not have to have the last word in your life. Entropy doesn't have to be the biggest factor defining your life. But here's the deal. God does not break the entropy of sin and death and hell and the grave in some generic sweep through the congregation. No, he does it personally. Okay, one person at a time. And he makes a wonderful promise to you. And he does so in about 20 words. In John chapter 1, he says, But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. If you are willing to repent of your sins and trust in Jesus Christ, the saving Lord, he'll adopt you into his forever family and you will become a beloved child of God. When God brings you into his family, get this, he gives you the gift of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the one who breaks the entropy of your present life and sets you on a new trajectory forever. And trust me, you'll like this new trajectory. It's a path of life and peace and purpose forever. Yes, you still have your moments of groaning and lament. We should do that. But your hope is far greater than your groanings. Friends, all of heaven is poised to forgive. The Father is willing to envelop you in the warmth of his everlasting embrace, but you must come by faith through grace, trusting in Jesus Christ, the saving Lord. If you've never done that, would you come right now? And when you do, a whole new life and a whole new world will open up before you. Come to Jesus. Come to him today.
Do you feel the world is broken? We do. Do you feel the shadows deepen? We do. And do you know that all the dark won't stop the light from getting through? We do. And do you wish that you could see Is all creation groaning? It is. But is a new creation coming? It is. And is the glory of the Lord to be the light within our midst? Is it good that we remind ourselves of this? It is. Is anyone worthy? Is anyone whole? Is anyone able to break the seal and open the scroll? Lion of Judah, who conquered the grave, he is David's root and the lamb who died to ransom the slave. Is he worthy? Is he worthy of all blessing and honor and glory? Is he worthy? Magnify the Lord with me. Come exalt his name together. Glorify the Lord with me. Come exalt his name forever. Magnify the Lord. Come exalt, come exalt his name together, glorify the Lord with me. Come exalt, come exalt his name forever. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Oh, blessed is he who hides in him. Thank you so much for joining us today for worship online. If this service was a blessing to you, how about sharing it with somebody else? And as you go about your day and go about your week, go with these words filling your heart. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing so that by the power of the Holy Spirit, you may abound in hope. I love you all. I hope to see you next week. God bless.